Truth was lost and hearts were frozen From you Allah came a prophet chosen Blessed prophet Muhammad obedient to you Taught us the things we ought to do He taught us for certain that you are one And that you have neither a daughter nor son He taught us to be good to our mother and father And that paradise lies under the feet of our mother I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise And follow your sunnah, prophetic ways I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise And follow your sunnah, prophetic ways Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Peace and the mercy of God be upon you. Welcome to Back to the Prophet, where we go back to the life of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, to discover the real meaning and intent of the Quran and Hadith, the sources, the two primary sources of Islam. In a previous episode, we were talking about the Battle of the Trench, the Khandaq, and a great victory that came by careful planning and tactics, and then by a miraculous wind that frightened the gathered Confederate army and caused them to abandon battle and lose a battle that was never fought by weapons, but actually was a victory uh, from directly from the heavens by Allah Almighty. The Prophet Muhammad ordered the Muslims to assemble around the treacherous Bani Khoreda who had violated their treaty and torn their treaty up and had planned to attack the Muslims and slaughter their innocent women and children and attack the forces of Islam from behind while the enemy was before them. And so he told them, don't pray Asr, the mid-afternoon prayer until you reach Khoreda. Now there were two groups and one group interpreted the saying of the Prophet by its literal words. And so they did not pray the mid-afternoon prayer until after it had expired. They prayed at Bani Qurayda. While the other group used their intelligence, al-aqal, the greatest gift we have from Allah, to understand and interpret the intent of the Prophet. And so they said, no, the Prophet intended for us to be to go as quickly as possible. He didn't intend for us to forsake the time of prayer. This tells us that in Islam, the ulama, the people of knowledge, those who have the wisdom and intelligence to lead the community, must interpret the Quran and Sunnah, not literally by its words alone, but by the Maqasid, or the true intent, the higher purposes. And so you must examine the verses of the Qur'an or the hadith of the Prophet and discover the purpose intended by those ayahs or hadith so that you can achieve what is intended, even if it may not be what is literally true. And so the people of knowledge are those who look for the intent and purpose of the lawgiver in revealing the law to us. Not necessarily those people who follow the literal word-for-word -word meaning. And so our great Imams, as Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik ibn Anas, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rejected those people who are called uh, Dahiris, those people who only follow the literal meaning of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and they followed the intent and purpose of the lawgiver as much as their intelligence and reason could tell them. This was a very important uh, time because Bani Qurayda uh, had betrayed the Muslims from inside their community. You can imagine a nation under attack from outside and a community within that nation uh, helps the enemy from within, living at peace in a country, you must protect your country and its people. Even if your country and people may be of a different religion than yourself. 
Yet you have an oath and an allegiance to your homeland where you're living in peace with your neighbors, even if they are Christians or Jews or other people. You cannot betray them, stab them in the back, and violate their security. And so they were punished by the decree of Allah. Those people who had not violated their tr treaty and had disagreed and did not violate their law, their, their treaty, and disagreed with their people, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi allowed them to go freely and to leave and go wherever they wanted in peace. And those men who were adult males, who had uh, planned that and, and attempted to execute the murder of innocent people, were sentenced to death, and that was taken taken that took place. Just as today, people who plan acts of murder and terrorism, even if they're not able to carry them out are punished by the law, sometimes to the utmost price. And so this battle was fought in, in, in psychology, in spirit, as well as in the hearts and minds of people. And there are clear lessons that our religion is a religion of peace and security, law and order and justice and fairness, and it must be also a rational Religion, not the religion of narrow-minded people who can only read words and letters on a page and cannot understand the higher purpose or maqasid al-sharia, the higher purpose of the laws. This led, after this failure of this huge invasion of Medina, the Prophet wanted to respond respond to this attack. Now you and I, we might think, the best thing to do after having this great victory is to now go and attack Mecca with an army and slaughter them as they had shortly before wanted to slaughter you. But Allah guided the Prophet in ways that sometimes human beings can't understand. So the Prophet was promised Fathun Mubin a great and clear victory by Allah Almighty. The Prophet saw a vision that the Muslims were wearing the garments of ihram, the garments of pilgrimage, of hajj and umrah, with their hair shaved as the pilgrim, after completing the rites, shaves or cuts his hair and sacrificing their sacrifices and gifts to the house of Allah Almighty. And so in Dhul Qa'dah, the year 6 of the Hijra, the Prophet was accompanied by 1,400 Muslims to go and make a peaceful pilgrimage. They were unarmed except for the very kind of small weapons that you would normally take with you on a trip. But no armor and all the lances and bows and arrows and all that kind of thing that you would need to fight a war. They went peacefully to enter Makkah to show Quraysh that we are standing up for our right to worship at the house of Allah, the house built by Abraham, because we are followers of Abraham, and we will peacefully enter Mecca. But Quraysh would not have the peaceful Muslims enter Mecca by any means. So they sent Khalid ibn Walid with his cavalry to stop them. And so the Prophet tried to go to Mecca through the back way. And on their way, before they got to Mecca, they stopped in the valley of Hudaybiyah. And when Khalid heard and discovered this trick, he quickly backtracked to Mecca to prevent them from passing Hudaybiyah and entering into the sacred precincts of Mecca. In Hudaybiyah, suddenly, the camel of the Prophet ﷺ stopped and it knelt. And he said, just as Allah ordered the elephant of Abraha on the year of the birth of the Prophet. When the elephant was invading Mecca, it stopped by the order of Allah. So my camel has stopped by the order of Allah. I will not proceed. And if Quraysh offer me any good terms, I will be open to their terms. But Quraysh would not listen. And they would not take this chance to negotiate. Every person who went to the Prophet saw that they were peaceful pilgrims 
And they were not armed. And they were not supplied for war. And they realized they had brought their sacrifice, sacrificial animals, the hedi, camels and sheep that they wanted to sacrifice for the sake of Allah in Mecca, as is the right of anybody in Arabia at that time. But Quraysh would not hear it. And they would not listen to any reason. And anybody from their own allies who came to them trying to intercede, saying, look, let the Muslims in, they would insult them and send them away. And so many of the allies of Quraysh were insulted and departed and left from their former allies and abandoned them in Mecca. At this time, Quraysh sent Urwa ibn Mas'ud to the Prophet to negotiate. And the Prophet ﷺ kept warning the Prophet and insulting him and in very clear way. But the Prophet was very, very patient with Urwa. And when Urwa saw the devotion of the companions to the Prophet, he realized that they are never going to surrender. It's better for us to allow them to enter Mecca peacefully. The Prophet would not allow the Muslims to fight. He knew that Quraysh would like to take any opportunity for war. So Quraysh sent, for example, young men at night to throw stones and attack the Muslims. But the Muslims would not respond and they would not attack those Jews. And when they grabbed them, they would simply send them back home. So the Prophet did not allow them to be provoked. And we today find that the Muslims are always easily provoked. And people who are in opposition to Islam insult Islam or attack Muslims to provoke a violent riot or an outburst to humiliate the Muslims and to make Muslims look like people who are uh, very violent and unreasonable people. But the Prophet would not allow the Muslims to be provoked into violence. That was not his intention and that was not his vision. And so the Prophet wasallam, sent Uthman ibn Affan to Mecca to negotiate. And he went to Quraysh and said, I only came here so that I can make tawaf, circumambulate the Kaaba. And Quraysh said, well, you're free to do that anytime. But he said, I won't do it until first Allah's Prophet does that. And of course, they would never allow him to do that. And so Uthman ibn Affan, while he was in Mecca, took that opportunity, trying to negotiate, visiting the houses of some of the Muslims who were being persecuted and still lived in Mecca, but were held prisoner and could not leave. Telling them, don't worry, Allah has promised for you, Fathun Mubin, a clear victory, so be very happy. And so those persecuted Muslims who were being held in chains in, as prisoners in Mecca were very, very happy to meet Uthman ibn Affan. But Quraysh heard of this and said, you are violating the terms of entering Mecca and so they kept him prisoner in his house. We'll go back to a break and we'll be back shortly, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise and follow your sunnah, prophet way. Closing the gap. Why closing the gap? In this program, Sheikh Yusuf Estes and Omar Dunlap are going to discuss how to bridge the gap between peoples of different cultures and orientations. The gap between males and females, Muslims and non-Muslims, the East and the West. Human beings feel like that they're being slighted one way or the other. The gap between the youth and the elders, the gap between various status in working, the work field and the education, and then trying to provide solutions for these particular problems. I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise and follow your sunnah, prophetic way. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to our program. Chapter 8 of the Holy Quran is Surat al-Fath. And Fath means a great victory or conquest or opening. 
And it is talking about this vision of the Prophet and the great victory promised by Allah. And this victory took place at Hudaybiyah. Because what happened was that Uthman was held prisoner by Quraysh. And when the Muslims heard of that, even though they were, had very small light weapons and they were very greatly outnumbered, they all gathered underneath a tree in Hudaybiyah and swore to the Prophet a pledge of allegiance they would not leave and they will fight to the death if necessary to protect the Prophet and to protect Islam and to protect Uthman ibn Affan. Because the rumor was that they were about ready to kill him. But when Quraysh heard that, the Muslims were ready to come and protect Uthman, they quickly let him go. And so they were ready now for a negotiation. And this is all mentioned in chapter 48 of the Quran, the great Fat. And so the Prophet ﷺ uh, negotiated and they sent Suhail to negotiate with him. And the Sahaba were gathered ready for war, but the Prophet calmed them all down. And now, when the re representative of Quraysh came, they saw the Prophet being very kind, very gentle to him. And they were very shocked. Why is he treating this pagan in this, you know, and being so humble to him. He didn't ask any opinion of his companions. Usually the Prophet practiced shura. He consulted with his opinion, the, the companions, about everything big and small that happened. And that is what we do as Muslims, we consult with one another. But Allah was directing him. And so when Allah directed him, he couldn't consult with anyone. Not Abu Bakr, not Omar, anyone. So they see the Prophet being insulted by this representative of Quraysh and he is being so open, so gentle and humble. Abu Bakr was furious. Or, or, pardon me, Omar was furious. He said, Oh Abu Bakr, aren't we Muslims? Isn't he the messenger of Allah? Why is he behaving in this way? Why is he treating us like this and treating that unbeliever like that? But Abu Bakr was very wise. He said, I swear he is the messenger of Allah, therefore, Omar, you must obey him. And so Omar calmed down. But Omar said to the Prophet the same thing he said to Abu Bakr. And the Prophet replied to Omar, I am the servant of Allah. I shall not disobey the command, and Allah will not cause me to fall into ruin. And so the Prophet dictated to Ali to write whatever the Suhail, the representative of Quraysh, told him. So the Prophet said, Say, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. But Suhail said, No, we don't know anything about Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. Those aren't names. Merciful and compassionate are not the name of our God. We only know the name of Allah. And so he said, Write your name and your write in your name, O Allah. Then he said, this is what, O oh Ali, write, this is what, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Rasulullah, Muhammad Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah, has agreed with Suhail. But Suhail said, no, I don't recognize that you're Allah's prophet. If you were the prophet of Allah, I wouldn't be here. And so write your name and your father's name. And so he agreed. These are humiliations to the prophet, denying uh, the Prophet's right to say he is the Prophet of Allah. Then he wrote, agreed to a ceasefire for 10 years. Nobody will be attacked. If somebody from Quraysh becomes a Muslim and leaves Mecca and goes to Medina, the people of Medina must send them back. But if somebody from Medina leaves and goes to Quraysh, they will not be sent back, even if they have left Islam. And there will be no disloyalty or forming any secret alliances to break this treaty. Any individual who wants to enter into any peaceful agreement is okay. You cannot enter Mecca, you cannot make the pilgrimage. But next year, when we decide, then you can come only with your sidearms. You can stay in Mecca and make pilgrimage only for three nights then you have to leave. And you can't bring anything else into Mecca. 
At that point, the Sahaba were shocked. Why would the Prophet agree to such a thing? Humiliating conditions. That if a Muslim from Makkah came, we have to send him back. But if somebody leaves Makkah, they won't send him back. At this point, Suhail's own son came out. He was bound in irons by his own father because he was secretly a Muslim. His father was torturing him and keeping him prisoner. But the Prophet had no choice. He said, look, I want to help you, but I have entered into this agreement. I will not violate it. You have to go back. And so this was shocking to all the Muslims that he would send this poor young Muslim back to his cruel father in chains. Then the Prophet said, be patient. And he ordered his companions, go sacrifice your hadi, your sacrifices, and shave or cut your hair as in the vision, as if you had completed your pilgrimage. But the Sahaba just stood there, shocked, dumbfounded. They were always so obedient to the Prophet. They were always, immediately would follow whatever the Prophet told them, but they didn't move. And he ordered them a second time, do your sacrifice and shave your hair. And they did nothing. A third time, they did nothing. Finally, the Prophet went into his tent and he talked to his wife, Umm Salama, and told them what happened. And she said, of course, they're in shock. You go out, you sacrifice, and you shave your hair, and then they will do. And so that's what he did. He went out, he sacrificed, and then he shaved his hair. And his Sahaba snapped out of their days and they realize he is Allah's prophet, and they did what they wanted. But they were, their hearts were so full, they were so confused. They were full of grief. They had been promised a great victory, fat from Allah. And this is what they got. So it was time for them to shave one another. There were no barbers with him. So they had to take their razor. But they were so full of grief, their hands were shaking like this. They were afraid they would kill each other. They kept cutting each other with the razors. They were so full they were so confused and so emotional. They were afraid they would kill one another. This looked like it was a failure. But Allah calls it Fathu Mubin, a clear victory. And with a short, in a short time, Quraysh realized the negative implications. They lost most of their allies. Most of the Arab tribes saw the Muslims as successful and peaceful and just and fair and saw Quraysh as being vengeful and arrogant. And so they broke their alliances with Quraysh, and they entered into alliances with the Prophet ﷺ. Before, there had been these clashes, but now, instead of fighting, everybody could meet together peacefully and negotiate. So people could come to Mecca, uh, pardon me, come to Medina and hear about Islam, then they would go back and teach Islam to their families and their relatives. And so within a short time, thousands and thousands of Muslims entered into Islam all over Arabia from all the different tribes. Within two years after Hudaybiyah, Islam had increased many, many times over. At Hudaybiyah, the Prophet had 1,400 men. But two years later, at Fat Makkah, the opening of Makkah, he went there with 10,000 well-armed men. It was truly a great victory. Today, many of us see victory as something that we win with blood, with weapons. But this was a victory through diplomat diplomatic negotiation, skillful, skillfully politically maneuvering, so that when you win the peace, you don't have to fight a bloody battle. In fact, there would never be a bloody battle against Quraysh again. But they had already fought their last battle, but they did not know that. And so you have to see that in Islam, there's more than one way to win. You can win politically and diplomatically. It's foolish that you would always try to win by military conquest or fighting when all you have to do to protect Islam is to make a peace so that the da'wah and the invitation of Islam can spread all over the world. Today, every city of Europe 
And North America and South America has mosques and Islamic schools and Islam in books, the internet and television is found all over the world. And the thousands and thousands of people enter into Islam day after day with no conquest at all. The majority of Muslims today live in countries that have never been invaded by any Muslim army ever in history. Not by the Sahaba and not by anyone after, but countries that have peacefully entered into Islam over the last uh, 1400 years. And Islam keeps spreading more and more. Many great countries of Islam have embraced Islam after colonialism in modern times when the French, the English, the Germans, the Dutch, and other people conquered many countries. And they tried with all their wealth to spread their religion, yet Islam spread in those countries faster because once they established peace and security, Islam was able to spread the messenger of the prof the message of Islam its universal message for peace and security spread throughout the world by keeping the peaceful dawah of Islam and using whatever means we can to secure our faith and our human rights and recognize the rights of other people to their faith and their human rights we can truly bring a victory to Islam as this diplomatic victory of Hudaybiyah was called in the Qur'an, in the chapter called Al-Fatah, the victory, Al-Fatah, Al-Mubin, the clear and great victory of Islam. And so we shouldn't be narrow-minded as Muslims, but we should see all the potential and all the possibility, use our reason and minds to choose the best way. May Allah Almighty guide and protect all of us and all the Muslim Ummah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When truth was lost and hearts were frozen from you, Allah came a prophet chosen, blessed prophet Muhammad, obedient to you, taught us the things we ought to do. He taught us for certain that you are one and that you have neither a daughter nor son. He taught us to be good to our mother and father And that paradise lies under the feet of our mother I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise And follow your sunnah, prophetic ways I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise And follow your sunnah, prophetic ways